Sienese Painting and the Age of the Renaissance by Bruce Cole. Chapter 2. In the early 15th century, several important Florentine author co-citizens were to exhort or I'm sorry, to exert a strong influence on a small number of talented Sienese painters who turned a long-standing Sienese flirtation with Florentine art into something deeper and more serious. The three Sienese artists, Domenico di Bartolo, Vicetta, and the sculptor Jacobo della Chiesa, like today. Tadeko, Todko, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced, Di Partolo, see chapter one, were div divisively influenced by several successive waves of Florentine art of the late Trecento and early Quattrocento. In 1408, Sp Spiniello, Aretino, and Aretine, Artists painting in the Florentine style completed a major fresco cycle in one of the most important rooms in the Palazzo Publico. The paintings embodied the crowded but structured narrative principles evolved by Spinello and his Florentine contemporaries. This idiom recalled that the fabled Giotto, whose ordered and lucid paintings were much admired by Florentine artists at the end of the Trecento. Spinelli's paintings and those of his Florentine contemporaries in both Siena and Florentine impressed Tadeo, Tadeo di Bartolo and his contemporaries just as works by Giotto and influence Duccio and Lorenzetti brothers. Of course, the influence was not just one way. For Giotto and other Florentines throughout the 14th and 15th century felt the powerful pull of the Sienese painting. Another wave of the Florentine, a Florentine influence came later in the Quattrocento when the stylistic and contextual innovations of Masaccio Donatello and their small band of followers were admired and imitated by several Sienese artists. Masaccio's realistic heroic paintings filled with a new naturalism were in many ways anti antithetical to Sienese art and culture, which usually eschewed simple, simple realism in any form. Nevertheless, we shall see in chapter three some of the implements of representation forged by Masaccio and Donatello were adapted to a visionary art by Sassetta and Giovanni di Paolo, who realized at once that with such tools they could make the fantastic and unreal startlingly vivid. However, a number of artists were deeply affected by Florentine art. They used to they used it to create idioms while that while basically since Sienese were strongly indebted to the art of Masaccio and Donatello. In fact, the styles of Domenico di Bartolo and Vecchia represented the peak of Florentine influence during the entire Quattrocento. The work of these two artists could never be confused with those of native Florentine painters, but their idioms reveal how eagerly they grafted Florentine inventions into their Sienese heritage. The Sienese artists were further exposed to Florentine art during the late 1420s when the font for the Siena Baptistry was commissioned. Two important sculptors from Florence, Donatello and Lorenzetti, oh, I'm sorry, Lorenzo Giberti, were employed to make bronze reliefs of the legend of St. John the Baptist. Gerberti's relief must have been admired by the people of Siena because it was both graceful and well-made, two qualities most esteemed in the city. Moreover, its rather con conservative, almost late Trecento narrative must also have pleased the traditional Sienese taste. Donatello. 
Tello's relief of the Feast of Herod, figure 14, was of a different order. It was something like a time bomb whose dazzling stylistic and contextual repercussions would be felt in Sienese for decades. Set in a complicated, dizzying ap atmosphere fashioned with all the latest Florentine techniques of representation, including the use of the one-point perspective system. The relief gives full vent to the horrors of the story it tells. A vacuum is created by the diner's flight from the grisly severed head of the Baptist, preferred like a main course on a salver. Twisting, turning, running, and stumbling, the figures create a human explosion that empties the center of the composition. The stage is set for this unique narrative by the purposely confused, complicated layers of background, architecture, and many patterns of the obviously worked bronze surface in a powerful condensed set of images. Donatello conveys a wild terror, revulsing and chaos of the Feast of Herod. The tension of this highly original and daring relief achieved through Donatello's considerable composition and figural skills left its mark on the Sienese artists Giovanni di Paolo and Sassetta, for example, were most impressed by its chaotic, unreal world, while others, Domencio and Di Bartolo and Vecchietta, among them were equally affected by Donatello's skillful creation of space and architecture to them. Donatello's work must have seemed a stunning use of the new representational tools of Florentine art. Of course, it was not necessary for Florentine artists to work in Siena for their art to have an impact. Siena is only about 50 miles from Florence, and the road between the two towns must have been used by Sienese painters and sculptors. One who seems to have traveled that road frequently was Domenico di Bartolo. Although his career cannot be charted with certainty because of a lack of signed and dated paintings, it appears that he was born around 1400 and Asinio, a small town near Siena, very eagerly, I'm sorry, very early in his training, perhaps even at its inception. He was strongly influenced by Florentine painting, chiefly that of Masaccio, Mussolino, and Filippo. Filipino Lippi, because the basic structure of his art is Sienese, even during the time he was actively absorbing the Florentine style, it appears that he is not trained in Florence, but in Siena itself. Perhaps he made a number of early trips to Florence with his master, or simply fell under the spell of the Florentine Florentines at an early age. Dementios Domenico's signed and dated Madonna of Humanity with Angels in, of 1433, figure 15, is one of the loveliest works of early science Quattrocento. Filled with a Florentine sense of form, if not spirit, and perhaps derived from a now lost picture by Masaccio, it is unlike any Sienese painting of the time, the composition revolves around the vol volumetric Madonna who tri triang triangle-like is the physical and psychological fulcrum of the composition. Behind her five irregularly placed angels who form a set of semicircle blocking, further movement into space as in the several surviving Madonna panels by Masaccio, the large figures dominate their bodies, create geometric shapes that give the picture weight. Gravity and peace, peaceful stability, three characteristics seldom encountered in the much more agitated and fragmented Sienese painting of the early Quattrocento. The pale pink of the angel's garments, the olive green pink and blue of the Madonna's robes and the almost pistachio of the cloth and on which the infant rests all display a sense of color and its courting peculiar to Sienese painting around 1400. This handling of the color and the treatment of the costumes and the faces suggests 
that Domencio, Domenico had his earliest training in the shop of someone like Paolo di Giovanni Fay or Tadeo di Bartolo. The latter is an especially likely candidate because of the Florentine influence apparent much in much of his art. Such a teacher would surely have encouraged Domenico to look at the latest Florentine developments. Domenico di Bartolo viewed these Florentine events with sympathetic and com comprehending eye more than any other Sienese painter. He understood the realistic, for straightforward painting of Masaccio and his few followers and was able to utilize its principles without distorting them. With Mussolini, Fra Angelico, and Felipe, Filippo Lippi, whom he might have influenced since this Madonna of Humility predate, predates Filippo's first dated, dated work by three years, Domenico di Bartolo formed one of the tiny group of acolytes willing to wrestle with Masaccio's empirical, heroic, and disturbingly unfashionable art. Consequently, Domenico's Madonna of Humility and has contributed contributed much more to Florentine than to Sienese art. Its impact on the latter was minimal, and its formal and ideological tenets were not fully appreciated in Siena. In 1447, four years after the Madonna of Humility, Domenico di Bartolo painted a Madonna and Child, figure 16, here, the two massive figures, unfortunately damaged, placed, too, placed close to the viewer, have the same awkward but compelling force one sees in paintings by Masaccio. Domenico di Bartolo cons consciously avoids the elegant canons of beauty so characteristic of his Sienese contemporaries in favor of a more direct, if less comely, image. The two human protagonists are vital and unsophisticated. Their bodies are carefully constructed and balanced. A profound, a profound emotional contrast between the curious blessing child and his apprehensive mother fills the picture with foreboding made all but the keener by the rose hedge of flowers and thorns around the top of the composition. While preparing this panel, Domencio di Bartolo, like Masaccio himself, may have looked at back at the Madonna, to the Madonna panels of Ambrosio Lorenzetti, in which the intertwined bodies of mother and child create a context, both tender and fearful, a mood of protection and apprehension. In fact, the Madonna's spread right hand of Domenico's painting is reminiscent of hands in several Ambrosio's paintings. It is possible that both the Madonna and of Humility and the Madonna and Child are modified copies of paintings of Masaccio or his circle, but Dementia, Domenico's series of frescoes for hospital for the Hospital of Scala, done in the 1440s, could never be mistaken for works planned by Florentine. For it is in these paintings that the Sienese elements in his work first begin to predominate at Domenico Falls, increasingly under the spell of his native art. The Hospital of Scala, is situated across from the Duomo, was one of the wealthiest and most powerful institutions in Siena. It functioned not only as the chief hospital for the city and its surrounding territories, but also as a charitable sorry, charitable institution of considerable importance. Already ancient by the 15th century, it was controlled by rotating committees of prominent citizens, including artists who employed painters and sculptors to decorate its wards and church from the influential facade frescoes now destroyed, painted in the Trecento by Ambrosio and Pietro Lorenzetti, to the works by Beccafumi done in the early 16th century. The hospital was the destination and repository of significant Sienese art. Domenico di Bartolo's 
frescoes, along with those by several other Sienese artists, were painted around 1445 and decorated a large reception area of the hospital called Pellegrino, Granaglio. Each fresco is devoted to some aspect of the institution's philanthropic work and together they formed one of the largest fresco cycles of the Sienese Quattrocento. Each painting is a treasure trove of information about the Scala and its many charitable functions. The care of the sick, education, and betrothal of the found foundlings, feeding and clothing of the poor, and the other frescoes in the Pellegrino bring quat the Quattrocento to life. For example, Care of the Sick, figure 17, shows with great accuracy the interior of a hospital ward. The patients are looked after by doctors and lay superintendents of the Scala, who are carefully depicted doing their good deeds. The composition of the washing of the patient's feet in the center foreground is borrowed directly from the traditional image of Christ washing the feet of his disciples which is seen in scores of Renaissance paintings, often new secular narratives, such as this one by Domenico di Bartolo, were simply adaptations of traditional religious stories that contain similar action. Moreover, the similarities between the two scenes of washing and the public display of humility, the act implies would not have been lost on the leading citizens of Siena who were immortal, immortalized in Domenico's fresco. Everywhere in the care of the sick, <clears throat> Domenico di Bartolo has emphasized the splendor of the costume and the complexities of the decoration. Nowhere else in Siena is there such a profusion of objects and portraits probably dictated by the... I'm sorry. Commission that... The almost microscopic vision here and in the rest of his Scala frescoes was quite alien to some of the Florentines who might inspire Domenico di Bartolo. The architectonic formation of the Florentine narrative was the spur behind Domenico's di Bartolo's minutely drawn education and betrothal of the found foundlings figure 18 under the arches of a large elaborate building with much architectural detail foundlings are being betrothed the furnishings of their dowries was an important function of the scala architecture and orders the fresco dividing the betrothal activities from the courtyard outside where young foundlings are being cared for and educated both the architecture and the figures are placed within an architecture accurate spatial construction in which all the orthogonals meet at a single point on the horizon consequently the space is ordered measurable and capable of mathematical expression qualitics seldom seen in sienese painting of the first half of the quattrocento this interest in depicting a measure seg measured segment of the world must st stem from the Masaccio, Mussolini, Molino, and Filippo Lippi, the pioneer realist of Florentine painting. Yet the overall effect of the picture denies its realistic construction. There is so much more, so much movement into and out of this of space by both figures and architecture and so much crisp anecdotal detail floor tiles decorated robes oriental rugs architectural moldings that the scene takes on a strange encrusted feeling far removed from the panel stern narrative frescoes of masaccio and his followers this wealth of detail and interest in anecdote which we have already seen in the works of domenico di Bartolo's immediate forerunners Bartolo di Freddi and Paolo di Giovanna, Giovanni Fe is part of the re-emerging Sienese ver vision which occurs in this and Domenico's other Scala frescoes. Many of the nurses 
and their charges in the education and betrothal of the foundlings are borrowed directly from Ambrosio Lorenzetti, an artist whose clarity must have been especially impressive to Domenico di Bartolo. Still, all for all his admiration of the Sienese ancestors and his Florentine contemporaries, Domenico's Scala frescoes are unique, a peculiar blend of realism and fantasy, of immediacy and, di and distance. Though they are filled with action and movement, they are strangely reticent and unapproachable. Domenico di Bartolo had a most unusual and interesting career. He was strongly influenced by Masaccio and became a bold and intelligent student of that innovative Florentine. Domenico's first paintings belong in the forefront of a stylistic current that also carried Filippo Lippi, Domenico Veneziano, and finally Piero della Francesca. His work was always strongly tem tempered by his Sienese precursors and contemporaries, but in its earliest stages at least is an anomaly anomaly in the art of Siena, where not even the most daring artist adopted so. Let me go ahead and do a close-up of that so you can see it. Of many Florentine conventions, yet yeah, by the time the Scala frescoes these conventions had been integrated in a formal and contextual scene, scheme that was Sienese from its striking color to its unreal spirit. The power and richness of Sienese tradition, which were compelling even to those fascinated with Florentine art, are apparent in another fresco in the Scala's Pellegrino. Gri the Vision of the Virgin, figure 19, by Lord Lorenzi di Pietro, called Vecita, he was a close contemporary of Domenico di Bartolo, and both men were strongly swayed by the Florentine counterparts. The Vision of the Virgin, painted in 1441, illustrates the vision of the mother of Sorori, the legendary founder of the Scala, the narrative centers on the ascent of the hospital hospital foundlings to heaven by means of a ladder. Scala in Italian, as they reach it, paradise, the Virgin welcomes them with outreach, our outstretched arms. Sori is seen twice, needing I'm sorry, kneeling at the foot of the ladder and again at the right, with his hand to his head. The attendant crowd, the many extraneous people included in this vision are disturbing, a disturbing element is ordered by the three arches of the church in much of the same way, much the same way that architecture is used to order the frescoes by Domenico di Bartolo, both of both in its der derivation from Brunelleschian's, I'm so sorry, principles, and in its use, uh, the armature for spatial and narrative organization, the architecture is strongly influenced by Florence. Florentine influence is also readily apparent in the figures in the crowd, both in costume and in figural style. These elegant people are modeled on Florentine prototypes, probably those by Mussolino, Domenico, Benziano, and Uccello, artists who must have impressed the young Vichetta might mightily the Florentine interest in antiquity must have also spurred him to include the the many roman inspired architectural ornaments and to the and the two friezes depicting nude figures of adam and eve and cain and abel which almost turn 
the facade of the church into a triumphal arch. But the feeling that arises from Vecchietto's fresco is far from the calm, rational world of Florentine art of the early Quattrocento. Vecchietti, perhaps affected by Domenico di Bartolo's frescoes, has created a chaotic and disorienting scene. The interior of the church becomes a tunnel as space rushes back into a nave that seems like something out of Alice in Wonderland. Further con confusion is caused by the side aisles whose spatial and architectural relation to the nave is unclear. What at first glance seem, looks rash, like rational Brunelleschian architecture turns out to be a setting for a supernatural occurrence, a vision of heaven, the use of complicated irrational architecture. Filled with nearly ob obsessive detail owes much to Donatello, specifically to his bronze relief, Beast of Herod of the Baptistry font, a work that was to interest Sienese artists for the entire Quattrocento. Vecchetti's relationship to Florentine art is fascinated and complex. Vecchetti is born in 1410 in the small town of Castiglione di Orecchia and appears to have received his early training in the shop of Sassetta, an artist also acutely aware of the latest Florentine development. But unlike his master, Vecchetti may actually have worked in Florence for his painting in the remote Lombard town of Castiglione de Olana, seem to have been done in connection with a group of Florentines who also were called to work there. In any case, from his earliest works, the Florentine influence permeates his painting. Perhaps the high point of his influence is to be found in a polyplectic now in Uffizi, a painting of the Madonna and Child with S.S. Bartholomew, James Alugis, Andrew Lawrence, and Dominic, figure 20. This altarpiece signed and dated 1457 demonstrates how carefully Vichetta had studied the work of his Florentine con contemporaries, Domenico Veneziano, Filippo Lippi, Andrea del Casto, Castagno, Fra Angelico, and Donatello. The harmony of the comp composition with the serious and silent saints, flanking the Madonna and Child in a perfect balance, <clears throat> is reminiscent of Fra Angelica, as is the convincing placement of the overlapping figures, a note of asymmetry is added by the Virgin who seems just slightly off balance on her architectural throne, which itself carves out a large spatial niche. Both the throne and the Madonna with her ample, rather coarse features recall Masaccio, an artist who must have continually amazed Visaccio and his fellow Sienese. But even at the height of his infatuation with the art of Florence, Vecchettio's pictorial language remains unique. Like all talented artists, Vecchettio takes much from others, yet he is able to transform his borrowings into something personal. In the Uffizi polyplectic, there is something decidedly unflorentine about the fervent saints who appear to be made out of crisp folded metal in fact. There is an overall brittleness about the painting, both in its form and in the feeling that arises from it, that is Vecchettio's own. Much of the same sort of spirit emanates from a large painting in Pienza, figure 21, which postdates the Uffizi polyplectic about, by about five years. This polyplectic of the Madonna and Child enthroned with S. S. John and Baptist, John the Baptist, Blaise, Nicholas, and Florian, is complete with an Annunciation lunette, the and three narrative predellas.
Sorry about that. <laughs> I wanted to make sure you guys got a good look. Okay. Since it was commissioned for the small church at Sp Spadoletto in the Val d'Orcia near Pienza, which was connect consecrated by Pius II in 1462, the painting was probably done about the same time. In the center portion of the altarpiece, Florentine influence is still strong and echoes of Domenico Veneziano remain. However, here the saints seem slightly more elongated and gaunt, their glances more burning, and their bodies even harder and sharper. The gracious Madonna and her twisting son and exercise in the latest Florentine techniques of complicated foreshortening form a stable and elegant focus for the saint's attention. However, it is the lunette above this group that is the most interesting part of the painting. The holy drama of the Annunciation unfolds in a luminous hall filled with sparkling white columns. It has been suggested that this great room may owe something to the light-filled hall church that Pius II built at Pienza, for which another painting by Vecchietta was commissioned. But the painter has in no way tried to give a realistic view of this structure. Rather, he has chosen to, to make it a part of the story of the Annunciation. The asymmetry of the lights note how the right wall is bathed in light, while the left one is in deep shadow as the light pours through its doors. And balances the tonal tonality of the painting and creates a disturbance within the carefully constructed room. Also, the swift flight of columns reminiscent of those in Vecchidia's Scala del Paradiso careens back into space so rapidly that the center of the composition seems strangely empty. Moreover, the striking white cylinders of the columns and the circles of pavement flattened to ovals by foreshortening create long, colorful forms that contradict the deep spatial construction of the building. The maroon and black patterns of the pavement seem to hover in space, detached from the floor they are supposed to cover. Now, as one can see by the construction of the building, Vecchio knew the rules of one-point perspective well. He had learned from them from learned the he had learned them through long study of contemporary Florentine works. But by the 1460s, he was more interested in subverting the rules for realistic representation than in carrying them out to the letter. This tendency had to had been seen before in the Scala del Paradiso. It is a thread that runs not only through the painting of Vecchietta, Vecchietta, where it becomes more and more prominent, but also through the work of many of the Sienese artists who were acquainted with contemporary Florentine painting. Vecchetti was not only one of the sublime Sienese colorists. Although he often uses color in a daring way, the floor patterns of the Pienza Annunciation being a case in point, his sense of color and his choice of colors, his blues, pinks, yellows, and reds, for example, derived from the Sienese tradition, perhaps because he was also a sculptor. Vecchetti like Michelangelo after him, often used color more as a structure than for its abstract decorative possibilities. Vichetta's <clears throat> hand is seen again in the Pianza Cathedral in one of the finest paintings of his maturity. The altarpiece of the Assumption, figure 22, erected in the 1460s by Pope Pius II, the cathedral was the jewel of the rebuilding of Pienza. Corsignana, changed by Pius to Pienza, in his honor was the Pope's birthplace and the quattrocento structures of this remote Tuscan hill town.
still testified to his architectural ambition and sophisticated patronage. The Pope, who was Piccolomini and thus one of the Siena's ruling's elite, con commissioned a series of altarpieces for the cathedral by the important Sienese artists of the day. The very fact that this humanistic, humanist pope, who would be expected to favor a classically inspired style, ordered works from the Quattrocento Sienese artists working within the traditions of their native city demonstrates the class classicity of so-called humanistic tastes. The altarpieces were placed in a very up-to-date frames of classical inspiration. In Vichetto's picture, the side figures were framed by simple, elegant moldings, a gilded arch swings above the ascending virgin, and the whole altarpiece is topped by a heavily carved pediment. The sumptuous frame is somewhat out of keeping with the wiry figures, which are very like those of Vecito's altarpiece in the museum directly across from the cathedral. The protagonist of the Assumption, which was probably painted around 1462, seem even spinnier and more nervous than their predecessors, the saints to either side of the Assumption, still exhibit traces of Vecito's indebtedness to Domenico v Veneziano and above all to Donatello, but they are of spirit of a spirit all Vecchio's own. They are curi a curious mixture of agitation and isolation, and they communicate more none of their secrets to the onlooker. Like so many personages by Vecchio Vecchietta and by Domenico de Bartolo, they are distant within, withdrawn into their holy me me meditations. So sorry. The Pienza assumption is a typical of the mature Vichetta's use of color, white, blue, green, and much gold. This picture must have been very expensive, predominant in the wings, but the palette is sober in comparison with those of many of Vichetta's Sienese contemporaries. In the Assumption panel there itself, there are brighter notes of red, violet, and blue. But the overall palette of the altar, altarpiece, while skillful and pleasing, is not exciting. Here again, color is not independent decorative force, except perhaps in the group of angels supporting the Virgin. But an aid to the construction of figures who appear almost to be made of thin sheets of ceased tin. For the assumption of Vecchietta has recalled a number of renditions of the theme from the past, including some resembling Andrea di Bartolo's figure 13. Although he has drawn inspiration from these earlier works, Vecchietta has modified them substantially. For instance, he has added a deep landscape with trees and mountains stretching to the far a far horizon. Moreover, the angels dancing on air as they carried the Virgin to heaven, a more volumetric and palpable and demonstrative of Vecchietta's exposure to Florentine painting around the frontal torso and head of the passive Virgin hover ranks and angels, ranks of angels and saints, their bodies carving out a sort of divine niche for her. Some of these figures, especially the old men, white beards, and fluttering, swaying angels, would be copied by Vichetti's heirs, most notably by Francesco Di, Gio Di Giorgio, whose work will be discussed in chapter four. However, it is not Vichetto's indebtedness or his influence that strike the onlooker, but rather the wonder of and mystery of the assumption, one feels little of the attempt at a rational, stable space that pervades an Uffizi polyptic figure 20, the center of the Pienza 
Madonna and Child with Saints, figure 21, or even the side of side wings of the Pianza Assumption itself. Rather, Vecchetta has set the miracle of the Assumption in an equally miraculous atmosphere and landscape. Shimmering with gold, the heavenly host ascends from an arid, twisting landscape where the doubting Thomas, dazzled with wonderment, stares heavenward. Gold color and form unite to create an image in the great tradition forged by the first Sienese painter a century and a half before. Free of the more empirical, more mundane, spatial, and formal concerns that so fascinated and frustrated him, Bichetta, what has given full range to his fertile Sienese imagination and created what is perhaps his masterpiece. In the 1470s, Vichetta began to plan his own burial place in the church of the Scala, of Scala, of the Scala to be decorated with painting and sculpture by his own hand. The altarpiece he designed and executed for his location still survives in the Siena Penacoteca in many ways that it is a reassertion of the fascinate of his fascination with Florentine art set in a large apse which reminds one of the Piero della Francesca's Barrera altarpiece commission for Urbino are the virgin and child two angels and SS picks SS Peter Paul Lawrence and Francis, the scale of the dome is monumental and its coffered expanse anticipates some of the vast structures to be seen in the works of Fra Bartolomeu. And Andreas del Sarto, several decades later, it is interesting that the architecture is rendered not in paint but in the much less illusionistic medium of gold, a shimmering material that conflicts with the fact fictive spatial properties of the dome. Because of these unreal and flattening, flattening tendencies, gold remained the background for hundreds of Sienese paintings well into the Quattrocento. In Florence, conversely, the use of gold began to decline during the first years of the 15th century because the metal interfered with the increasing realism of figures, architecture, and landscape, the differing ideas on the use of gold held by artists on, from the two cities epitomize the ver their varying views on the nature of painting. In the center of Vecchio's altarpiece sits a large, the larger monumental virgin holding the blessing child in facial features, drapery style, and general bearing. These two figures Products of Vecchio's most mature and pensive period are closely related to the Pianza, Madonna and Child with Saints and Assumption. The scale and seriousness of these figures mesh with the surrounding space and the Roman-inspired dome. The same cannot be said of the attendant figures of the, the two angels peeking from behind the throne, perhaps inspired by similar characters, and Masaccio's piece of altarpiece are smaller in scale, but not disturbing. However, the four saints are not only out of scale, but a, a, of a different body type from the Madonna and child. Spindly note their puny hands, fussy in their detail, lacking the emotional charge of many of the artist's earlier figures, and timid in both glance and gesture. They seem curiously out of step with the large, dignified Madonna and noble apse. Can this difference be explained by Vecchita's warning powers? Possibly, but it is pl also plausible that the artist died before the work was completed. He seems to have been working on it in 1479, the year before his death. This is, the attendance could have been painted and planned by members of his shop or by an outside artist called in to finish the job. To my mind, that is the only way to account for such major differences between architecture. The Madonna and Child and the Saints, nonetheless, con the conception of the work is wonderful and certainly belongs to the mind of Vecchita. It also reveals once more the pull of Florentine art on his remarkable imagination. 
However, the true genius of Vecchio resides not in his painting, but in his sculpture. To trace the development of his work in stone, bronze, and wood goes beyond the limits of this book, yet no account of this sophisticated and complex artist would be complete without some discussion of his sculpture. Vecchia's most famous sculpture, like the large painting of the Assumption, was intended for his own tomb. Now in the Church of Scala, this nearly life-size bronze figure of the resurrected Christ, figure 24, is one of the most striking and haunting Im images of the Quattrocento Siena. Instead of the triumphal reborn Christ, almost always associated with resurrection, we see here a gaunt and in crevated Creveted, I'm sorry, being at once sensuous and repelling, this mannered figure with open mouth and bulging veins is indebted to the bronze sculpture of Donatello, who was working in Siena in, 14, in the 1450s. Vichetta carefully studied the bronze, studied the bronze St. John that Donatello probably made for the Siena Cathedral and the two bronze pulpits for San Lorenzo and Florence. Their nervous energy, their intensely personal approach, and the, the revolutionary handling of the bronze must have fascinated and deeply impressed Vecchietta. Yet this type of figure appears earlier in Vecchietta's own painting. In the two altarpieces in Pienza, for example, so Donatello's work in bronze must have appealed to something already formed in Vecchietta's fertile mind. In any case, Vichetta's Christ and Donatello's late work share a raw reservation. Um, I'm sorry. Nervous, sorry, and a pessimistic that removed them from all other contemporary sculpture. The Christ, which was to be part of the tomb complex, Vichetta designed for himself, is full of pain in it enigmatic, nervous, and devoid of hope. Much like the resurrected Christ of Donatello's San Lorenzo pulpits, Vichetti's depiction of the central figure of Christianity seems hardly capable of life, let alone the salvation of mankind. A bronze resurrection of Christ, figure 25, in the Frick collection, probably also from Vichetti's tomb complex, is also strongly influenced by Donatello, the jumble of soldiers, at the faceting of the rock formations, and the bold abstracted handling of the bronze reveal study of San Lorenzo pulpits or some other works, other late works by Donatello. But the gracious levitating Christ and the swathed attendant angel show a feeling for formal polished elegance, evident also in the Pienza assumption that was shunned by much more direct and expressive Donatello. The large areas of smooth polished bronze that back the figure have almost the same function as the gold backgrounds in Vichetta's paintings. There is a disconcerting relationship between the volume of the foreground figures which are worked in high relief and the flat bronze areas on which the mandorla of cherubim surrounding Christ and the clouds of angels around his head have been applied. Once is reminded of some of the spatial characteristics of Donatello's pulpits of the 1460s and of Giobra Giberti's second doors for the baptistry of Florence compl completed around 1450. In both his painting and his sculpture, Vicetta, like Domenico di Bartolo, absorbed many of the latest Florentine developments from his early Scala frescoes to the late altarpiece for his tomb. His principles of compositional organization were strongly indebted to his study of Florentine art, taking much from Donatello, both he and Do Domenico de Bartolo used one point perspective and convincing volumetric figures. Sorry.
figural construction to make their images and narratives increasingly less realistic and earthbound. This pattern of borrowing and adaptation it is both common and traditional in Sienese art. It begins before Duccio and is found even in the last paintings of the school. But nowhere is the connection between Siena and Florence as strong and obvious as in the works of Domenico di Bartolo and Ver Vichetti, the two artists who had heard the siren song of Florence more often and with greater intensity and did the other Sienese artists, but their later works clearly demonstrate that both artists remain strong adherents to the Sienese tradition. Their striking mixture of fantasy and fur was shared with, by a small group of contemporaries who were remarkable visionaries. And this will be the end of chapter two. Thank you.